This is Constant Wonder. I'm Marcus Smith. Welcome to part two of a two part episode on infrasound, those deep rumbles that lie below the threshold of human hearing. If you're new to this podcast, Constant Wonder is dedicated to the emotion of awe that changes us for the better. This kind of awe can come into our lives as we are attentive to art, science, human relationships, history, nature, medicine, actually anywhere at all. These experiences of wonder can spark a sense of mystery or surprise and can tug at us with an almost unexplainable magnetic pull. In part one of this episode, we spoke with Jeffrey Johnson, a volcanologist who listens to the deep murmuring of volcanoes, trying to anticipate when they might blow. Here in part two, we're going to speak with Caitlin O'Connell, a scientist who spent 30 years studying elephants in Namibia. Over the course of her career, she's been highly attuned to animal sounds, the sounds they emit as well as the sounds they receive. With innovative technology, she has recorded the mating calls of tiny bugs in Hawaii, but then also, a hemisphere away, low-frequency rumblings exchanged by African elephants. From her later career, some of what she's discovered may eventually fold into new medical tech to assist humans with impaired hearing. So we're going to hang out with Caitlin O'Connell today, in part to focus on the wonder of animals and infrasound, but as we go, something additional will emerge quite clearly. How a mind such as hers, intent on achieving an understanding of natural phenomena, can make bright new connections. Behind her findings is a capacity for close, patient, engaged observation. This story of her close observation begins when O'Connell was a young graduate student studying entomology far from Africa. I was getting my master's at the University of Hawaii, and my study was on plant hoppers, a very tiny insect that's in the same order as cicadas. So everyone knows what a cicada is, very loud broadcasting signal. But these tiny little insects broadcast their signal into a substrate, a plant. I would go and look for patches of seedlings and these little plant hoppers were calling on the seedlings to attract a mate. And the only way you would know that, it's like putting a gramophone stylus, sticking it onto a plant and magnifying the amplitude of the signal. And then you can hear these different amazingly Hawaiian sounding music that these plant hoppers were producing out of a little drum uh, between their head and thorax, there's this tiny little drum that pops in and out and makes these beautiful songs. The plant hopper study that I did required many hours of me staring at these tiny little insects through a microscope with a gramophone stylus on the stem of the plant and watching these males generate these mating calls. And I would place a female, and it's usually a nine-day-old female that's ready to mate, when he was searched for her, it was as if he was feeling vibrations through his feet. And that's how they pick up these calls is, is through vibrations on the plant and their feet pick up the vibrations and then they interpret them. I finished my master's and I took a year off to go to Africa and I was planning to return. But then at the end of that year, my boyfriend, now husband and I were invited to work on a three-year funded study on elephants in Namibia. And so what I thought was a year gap turned out to be <laughs> three years studying elephants. In Africa, she was to make a discovery about elephant behavior specifically tied to her previous observation about plant hoppers. Here's how that happened. One day she was staking out a water hole shared by a lot of creatures including various elephant families and other species as well, predators, for instance. During the day, the elephant families would use the water hole and then wander off. Other groups of elephants would then arrive. The comings and goings appeared to be by chance. But then O'Connell realized that these arrivals and departures might involve infrasound transmitted through the ground. When I first started studying elephants in the wild, I made this unexpected connection between 
the postures that these male plant hoppers were putting themselves in is a very specific searching posture. You know, the plant hoppers would really kind of hunker down on their legs and then lift one off the ground and then move around a little bit, press down. And the elephants would put themselves in a very similar posture just before the arrival of another elephant family group. And elephants were doing this as a whole group. And I'd never seen it before in my travels. We spent a year traveling in Southern Africa and in game parks. And it was only after being isolated for a long period of time at our field site, watching them day in and day out, that I noticed, wait a second, as this group is leaving, they're all freezing, like leaning forward and freezing, just like the plant hoppers would do. And then they'd lift a foot off the ground. And it was because there was a whole group of them that it was, to me, it looked obvious, like, wait. They're all doing this. They've stopped mid-stride and they're leaning forward and lifting a foot. And then a little while later, sure enough, another family group would arrive. And so it seemed incredible that I got the inspiration from this tiny creature, but yet not so thinking that, well, if that's how you detect a vibration, if that's how an animal is going to do it, then why not the elephant? (laughs) Different species, vastly different sizes. Still, what O'Connell connected in her mind is that both her bugs in Hawaii and her elephants in Africa were lifting one leg to exert more pressure on an adjacent foot. It seemed to be a way for them to concentrate attention, to optimize the incoming signals. She describes it as a way for an elephant to achieve a greater coupling of the foot with the ground. I like to think that O'Connell's focus on this animal behavior, be it the behavior of the plant hoppers or the elephants, had to be just as concentrated. Only close patient scrutiny could have revealed for her what was happening behaviorally on opposite sides of the planet, the very same trick being used by megafauna here and microfauna there. With the plant hoppers, their mating call vibrations were carried along the stem of a leaf undetectable for humans, without a tiny seismograph. In the elephant realm, calls moving through the air from one animal to another were obvious and audible to both human and elephant alike. But then there seemed to be some added dimension, something else going on along another path, beyond conventional detection through the outer ear. Um, Could be a small pink ear like mine or a big floppy one like an elephant's. I noticed this very soon after I started focusing on their vocalizations and studying them. Just that one little aha moment got me thinking, is it possible that these elephant, very high sound pressure vocalizations, could they be coupling with the ground and and propagating in the ground and then detecting them? And that launched a whole 10-year inquiry into whether this was really the case. And so, to borrow a phrase from Shakespeare's Henry V, later also used by Sherlock Holmes, the game was afoot. It wasn't enough for O'Connell to have a hunch that the elephants are hearing with their feet. She had to prove it. So an elephant vocalization, a rumble vocalization, as it's called, is a low frequency signal. It's produced at 20 hertz. Our speaker systems are all rated from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, but most people can't hear down to 20 and maybe it's 35 or 40 hertz. And the difference in being able to hear those lower and lower frequencies is how loud the sound is produced. Elephants broadcast their signal at 120 decibels, which is like a mini explosion. And while they generate that very low frequency, 20 hertz signal at 120 decibels, they're creating this ripple across the surface of the Earth. The Earth, you have to think of it as an elastic medium. And even as an elephant walks or produces this vocalization, it's going to propagate over the surface, just like if you toss a stone into water, say. And that signal then propagates over long distances. 
How far can this go? I mean, I'm just curious about the radius of, you know, before the ripple starts to fade. There actually is no outer limit. This is the fascinating thing about ground vibrations. These signals travel much further in the ground than they do in the air. So we still don't know what the outer limit is, but geophysicists have measured signals in the ground for hundreds of miles. Not that an elephant could produce that necessarily, but thunder has been measured in the ground for for many miles. Given everything O'Connell has just explained, what would you do next in order to prove your hunch? That elephants avail themselves of rumbles under their feet for long-distance communication. Over a decade, she experimented in a number of clever ways. In one experiment, her team recorded a call that elephants make to warn of predators nearby. They clipped out the audible higher frequencies in that recording, leaving only infrasound frequencies. Then, some 20 meters away from the waterhole, they buried an enormous subwoofer in the ground for playback of that subsonic warning signal. Remember, these sounds can travel for many miles, so the precise distance from the waterhole didn't really matter. The team then set up other microphones to make sure no audible sound waves from their recording were escaping out into the open air. We broadcast that signal through several different devices. One was originally made to vibrate the seat of your car with your car stereo, and the other was made for the home theater industry called a butt kicker, mounts to the joist of your home so that your your home theater vibrates. So it's a very inexpensive way for us to produce a very strong signal with integrity in the ground at the source. We've got all the wires buried and when we're ready to deliver the signal, the signal is delivered from one floor of the tower and the observers are in another floor of the tower. So it's all controlled in this one place and the source is about 20 meters away from the water hole. So when they're finished drinking, that's when we deliver the signal. O'Connell explains how, at these very low frequencies, the most subtle differences in pitch can carry a lot of information to the foot of an elephant. So from 20 hertz to 30 hertz seems like nothing for a dolphin or a bird that can jump a 1,000 hertz. (laughs) But for an elephant, say it's a seven-second signal goes uh, two seconds at 20 hertz and then up five seconds at 30 hertz and then back down uh, to 20 hertz and then up for the last two seconds, that tells you that something is wrong, there's trouble, and we have to pay attention. That simple rise and fall in frequency, which is that increase in pitch. Then we did a more sophisticated study, not just can they detect the signal on the ground, but they can detect a known versus an unknown caller. One call was made in Kenya, the other was made at my field site. So they were the same call, but an unknown caller versus a known caller. And the elephants responded much stronger to the signal that was made in their territory, which it's only a few frequencies off, you know, two hertz. My smartphone can help me filter out known from unknown callers. Why shouldn't an elephant be just as curious to know who's calling? I'll not conjecture as to whether an elephant ever responds to spam. The whole point here is that with tiny shifts in frequency, an incoming call can be recognized as belonging to a familiar friend or a stranger. The idea that we humans underuse our own senses, that we have untapped abilities in our own bodies for nuanced detection and differentiation of various stimuli, from smells to tastes to sounds and the like, well, we have considered this issue many times on Constant Wonder. But still, I have to confess, I was surprised to learn that people might just be out of practice with infrasound, at least to some degree. Like elephants, we do have this capacity to detect vibrations below the hearing threshold. If humans can, if elephants can, well, who else? All mammals have the ability to detect vibrations just like elephants do. But for us as humans, we have so many different ways of communicating long distance that our sense of vibrations has really 
gone by the wayside except for people with hearing impairments. That got me going down the path of somatosensory hearing devices and then bone conduction hearing devices just based on these early studies that I did on elephants showing that they could discriminate these fine resolution differences through their feet, through these somatosensory receptors in their feet. Now, this is quite interesting info here. The somatosensory system, it uses movement or vibration in muscles, joints, or skin, and it gives us perceptions of pain, pleasure, or other information. This alternative sense, like its close cousin called bone conduction, well, it has implications for human hearing loss or compensating for hearing impairment. Caitlin O'Connell's discovery of elephants listening through their feet brings us to another turn along her remarkable career. Before long, it led her to research and teaching positions at Stanford and then Harvard Medical School, where she now teaches in the Department of Otolaryngology. This might seem like an improbable leap in her career from watching elephants at a waterhole until you think about it a little. I've been in a medical school research environment for more than 20 years, and that's mostly because of what we can learn about low-frequency sound and hearing and production from a low-frequency ear like the elephant's. I was also in the experimental physics lab at Stanford, and it turns out a lot of my studies end up being very physics and engineering oriented. <laughs> and if you're studying low frequency sound, you just by nature are in the physics realm because of how sounds propagate. Three decades down the road from where she started, O'Connell says there's still much that she, and hence we, don't know about how elephants use infrasound to communicate. There's a lot of different things that elephants could be employing with this vibration-sensitive skill that they have. The other thing that I'm doing now at the Eaton Peabody Lab at Harvard is to look at how much better elephants are at bone conduction hearing than humans. So I went from a somatosensory world to now looking at bone conduction. And elephants have two orders of magnitude better bone conduction hearing than humans. And human bone conduction hearing aids could be a lot better than they are. And we're trying to see what that difference is between the elephant and human that could maybe inform a better human bone conduction hearing aid. Let me take a brief moment here for a quick recap of what we know are three different avenues for sound or impressions of sound to reach our brains for interpretation. First, we have bone conduction, which to me sounds like such a simple piece of physics. It's like striking a tuning fork on its end so that the vibrations are set in motion all along the length of the tines, the bones. And then there's somatosensory detection by the muscles, joints, and skin, which employs neural connections to the spinal cord and the brain instead, bypassing the rigid bone structures. And of course, we have those familiar vibrations moving out through the open air to be gathered in by our ears, funneled down to the eardrum, taken down inward to tickle the cochlea. This is hearing as we generally think about it. And though these different pathways may be in use simultaneously, each pathway has its own distinct dynamic. Are there still other pathways when it comes to the beats and the pulses, the oscillations and reverberations that are all around us? I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Having pivoted from field work more toward medical research, Caitlin O'Connell never allowed her passion for elephants to wane, and she returned to them most summers. The intersection of her interests had something to do with biomimicry, she explains. I still go back to Africa on the Elephant Project and was funded by National Geographic and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I kind of had these two parallel things going, but always had the same goal of understanding acoustic stress and how to develop a better hearing aid by what's called biomimetics. So learning a pattern in nature and applying it to something in the human realm, whether it's a mechanical engineering or biomedical product. 
And this coupling of life sciences with biomedical research had yet another upside to it, a rather personal or interpersonal one, if you ever think of elephants as persons. She knew elephant families and individuals extraordinarily well, their rituals, their personalities, even their leadership styles. And in her fascination for the social aspects of elephant life, she found that just as with humans, some individuals are more magnetic than others. Captain Kirk is an older gentleman who's very well loved by the young males because he lets them kind of hang on him and hang their trunk over his tusk while he's trying to drink. And he's just a, a big old softy that these young males are thrilled to be around. Her favorite, and she's not shy about picking favorites, is Big Mama, an impressive matriarch whose position of seniority has made her family group more durable. Big Mama garners an unusual level of respect. Even if she's behind by five minutes because she's heavily pregnant, she's waddling around and the whole family's waiting for her. When she finally gets to the waterhole, they give her an elaborate greeting ceremony. And she was just at the back of the family. It's not like she was gone for a month. <laughs> it's, it's just so amazing to see the reverence that elephants have for certain individuals, and it makes you want to understand what that reverence comes from and how it evolves over time. And that's one of the things I've been studying is this how character permanence manifests and how it's influenced by those around them. Was there a certain point at which you thought, I really, really am not just interested with my head in these animals. There's something about them that... Uh, you know, I don't want to compare it to, you know, my pet cat, but uh, some kind of affection for them. <laughs> yes. In the beginning, I was hired to help farmers keep elephants out of their fields. And so it was like going from the tiniest crop pest to the largest crop pest and most intelligent. I had to look this up to be absolutely sure, but yes, it turns out the plant hopper in Hawaii, for all the musical charm of its mating call is a pretty serious crop pest. And in Africa, of course, conflicts between elephants and farmers, well, those are notorious. With the elephants in Namibia, Caitlin O'Connell explains, they were not initially focused on individuals in their research. My first task was at a population level. We were counting them, we were monitoring their movements, and also dealing with how they interface with people. So I lived in an area with uh, very rural farmers and open system where the elephants would cross the river at night from the national park, sneak across, go into crops and then come back. Very large numbers of elephants. But then in Atasha National Park, where we got to go in the summer to analyze the movement data, that's the, the special times when I got to watch individuals and um, really get to know them. And then over time, you know, it's been 30 years that I've watched some of these elephants are still around because they're very long lived. And yes, I do have a, a strong affinity, especially for some individuals that try and keep the peace and ones that are so well loved by their peers. You know, it's like being an anthropologist and kind of being a voyeur and watching another society and how they treat each other, how they live their daily lives. And it's a real privilege to be able to do that. How rapidly are you able to shift gears from being the somewhat detached, data-driven scientist and then suddenly you say, well, I just empirically proved that my adrenaline can flow when I hear a lion roar. You know, that's, that, those are two different modes of existence. <laughs> um, well, they don't have to be. I mean, I think that's the stereotype of a scientist that they are detached. But I find it's a much more fluid existence. You know, I see Big Mama and one of her favorite, her daughter, Nandy, having this greeting ceremony and the flapping of the ears and placing a trunk in the other's mouth. And there's so much decorum around this whole elephant greeting thing. I'm taking notations on, on who's present and who's involved in the greeting ceremony, but I'm also emotionally present and imagining what that 
sensation is. Like they see each other, they, they greet them, but they see them. You know, the stereotype for male elephants, although it's changing now, is that they wander around and they're by themselves and they leave the families and they only come uh, and encounter females when, the, when they want to mate. But that it couldn't be further from the truth. Adult males actually have their own society and relationships and best friends. And, and when they greet each other, there's, there's such visual, um, I'm going to call it emotion, because as they raise their trunk up to place it in the mouth of the other elephant, they're shaking. The trunk is shaking with such anticipation of, of greeting this other elephant that they revere. And then they step back and their shoulders drop and they just relax after they have done this very important ritual. And, you know, we see that if you're going to greet the queen or the pope or in the mafioso world, the, the Don, which is what I call the dominant uh, male elephant in our population, because he has these males around him that, that treat him with such very pronounced reverence. I think we try and separate ourselves from the the animal kingdom saying that, you know, we have emotions and and the rest of the animal kingdom really doesn't. But that perspective has changed a lot in recent years. There's some good studies in other primates showing how uh, grieving individuals have very high cortisol levels from the stress of, of that loss. And I think the more we can appreciate how similar we are to other animal societies the maybe we you know realize that we're not as special as we want to think we are and and, and maybe have a, a more balanced view of ourselves in this world I'm often intrigued when I get to meet or talk with people like Caitlin O'Connell not only about where they're coming from, but where they come from. What kind of childhood produces someone who has the capacity and the drive to master multiple fields of science, then also the empathy to care deeply about the creatures she studies? Well, I think I developed a love for nature at a very young age, assisted by my father who took us on camping trips. And we had a lot of the natural world in a, you know, five acres we had woods and a stream and a pond. And so we had all of these different, very small creatures that would come out seasonally, frogs and crayfish and fish and birds. But I was very interested in the natural world and, and sitting out and watching the world go by. I had a catch and release frog program where I would see how many I could catch them and let them all go. And I think that may have developed the patience, but that it was that process of practicing, of sneaking up to them and being very quiet and catching them. It was a really fun thing for me to do. <laughs> and I enjoyed fishing um, and then drawing and taking pictures and, and journal writing. And so from a young age, I evolved these different ways of helping me see the natural world around me through honing these skills of writing and photography um, from that early love of being outside with the creatures of my backyard um, into what I am today. I really appreciate what you've said about sitting and observing because we're in motion so often. You know, our modernity pushes us out the door and we think we have to move, move, move. Yeah, and our eyes can't really focus on those tiny little things that are moving and changing if you're moving. So it's hard to notice unless you're sitting. Can people get better at this noticing? Yes. Um, yes, especially using a tool like journaling, you become a little uh, hobbyist, like if you need uh, a bird book and try and see how many birds you can tick off or even um, notice the different kinds of plants and draw the leaves and see how they're different and what, what kind of buds or flowers or depending on what season you're doing this. There's lots of different tools that you can use to help you in and get more engaged 
uh, when we were in the Serengeti, my husband downloaded the app Merlin that was developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And it's this amazing bird app that you can put in either the song or take a really poor picture even of the bird and it'll just tell you what it is like the what was it the uh, one of the hornbills a trumpeted hornbill um he put in and and then i lost him because he was then looking at every single bird and getting them into his merlin app <laughs> which can distract you we do have this collector mentality, the ticking, twitching mentality of what got to tick off everything that we see. And then it kind of it separates you from the real purpose of observing and feeling and sensing. It puts a little bit of a wedge between you because it's all becomes a game. But if it gets you in, if it gets you appreciating like, oh, my gosh, here's the, the Oriole just flew in, you know, and uh, March, April, when I start to see them build nests, you pay more attention. And sometimes we do need those tools to get us there. For me, I, I think drawing and, and taking pictures helps. But again, taking pictures also can put a distance between you and the object. So sometimes just sitting and looking and thinking is the best. When was the most recent opportunity when awe or wonder was something that you experienced and you were kind of gobsmacked by it? Well, that was very recent. I led a, a Stanford family Christmas trip to the Serengeti. After 30 years of working in Southern Africa, I had never been to the Serengeti. And just dropping into that valley and having this endless sea of rolling hills all around us, that was gobsmacking. I I did not expect that. Well, what happened there? Um, it was so beautiful. I, I'm even tearing up about it. <laughs> well, there there were two moments. The one I don't know if you know if anyone's been to Yellowstone and come into that Lamar Valley uh, where there's still wolf populations. That was a moment of awe for me some years ago. But this was similar, but yet the hills just kept on rolling out. You know, if you're in the ocean, you see the horizon, it's out there. But this just seemed like true infinity. <laughs> you just turn around in all directions. And had it just rained, so it was all green. And you have the acacia trees to kind of demark each roll of the hill as it goes out into the distance. And then at another point, the wildebeest had just arrived. So they migrate 120 miles from southern Serengeti to the northern Serengeti just before the first rain. It triggers them. It looked like a forest, an infinite forest out there, and it was all wildebeest. And you just wonder how in our natural world did these amazing patterns in nature evolve and the migration of the wildebeest is, is one of those uh, just wonders of the world, really. O'Connell has also had some awe-inspiring moments with lions. And if elephant stomps aren't enough to make you feel small, she says a lion roar might do it. It's true. I mean, feeling like you're a part of the food chain is a very <laughs> disconcerting sensation and one that I had never felt until I heard my first lion roar in Africa. <laughs> it was pretty overwhelming. I oh, mean, don't just I stop am... there. You've got to tell <laughs> the whole story. Well, I mean, the, the pressure waves, the physical hitting of your chest by these waves, it's actually supposed to induce a fear response, apparently. Um, but th just feeling the awe, the power of these can I play one for you? Yeah. That was a pair of very lazy lions, honeymooning lions. And this is their dawn territorial roar. Territorial roars are made as an acoustic fence. So they're telling their neighbors at another water hole that Yes, this, in fact, is their water hole, and don't think about coming over here. But it, it wasn't the most powerful roar. 
they look like kitty cats. I mean, they are so affectionate with each other that you kind of forget that they could eat you in a second. And just to be around that every day and at night to hear hyenas calling and, and jackals and lions eating and fighting over their food, it's very primal. It's so dark. So you're looking at the amazing Milky Way and listening to all of these amazing calls that travel so well in the cold desert nights and the elephant vocalizations we record at night, along with all these other animals. It's, it's just, um, it's really magical. I wasn't there when Caitlin O'Connell experienced what must have been a classic moment of sudden recognition, you know, an aha moment. Those plant hoppers, these elephants, is this the same behavior? Is, is this a kind of hearing? Being attentive, being present to the world around us, it can lead where we expect science to lead us, to deeper and more precise understanding, to animal conservation, to potential medical interventions. But there's something else a little bit more difficult to chart here. The magical part she mentioned, or the kind of personal reward that comes from watching and gaining admiration for a particular creature, maybe even a single elephant named Big Mama. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. This episode was produced by Eric Schultzka and Mamie Teeples. And just a reminder that this is part two of a two-part episode on Infrasound. If you missed the previous episode, jump back on your podcast feed and you'll find it there. The Constant Wonder Podcast is a production of BYU Radio. And a quick final item here for you that might be of interest. You know, we're always thinking about our listeners to Constant Wonder, looking for great stories to bring you. We have to pick and choose, of course, and that means that some of the stories we really like still might not make it into an episode. Doesn't mean we don't want to let you know about them, though. Recently, the Sundance Film Festival wrapped up. All kinds of films play there, from the weird to the wonderful. Some big-name stars show up on the red carpet, and it's a great place for first-time filmmakers to get noticed. Well, our producer, Tenery Taylor, watched a whole slew of movies from the festival with you in mind. And if you'd like to read about a few of them that we think you'll like, you can find Tenery's reviews in the bonus features on our webpage. Come check it out at byuradio.org.